our soils are the oldest soils in the world. You know, we don't and shouldn't farm the way Europe farms because we need to farm the Australian way. We needed to listen to Indigenous elders while the knowledge was still there and we, we didn't. So we've made some massive mistakes. Let's make no bones about that. That was Lorraine Gordon and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott and in this podcast series I'll be uncovering the world of regenerative agriculture, its people, practices and principles and empowering you to apply their learnings and experience to your business and life. I'm an 8th generational Australian farmer who transitioned my family farm from industrial methods to holistic regenerative practices. Join me as I dive deep into the regenerative journeys of other farmers, chefs, health practitioners and anyone else who's up for a yarn and find out why and how they transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. G'day, welcome back to the show. Today's episode is all about Lorraine Gordon. Um, Some of you may have heard about about Lorraine. It's all good. She's a a real dynamo and I caught up with Lorraine at the Mig Raising Field Day up at Ebor uh, in February this year. Um, Lorraine has really paved the way for not just females, but certainly people in the regenerative ag space, certainly in the you know, government policy creation and certainly in the tertiary education world. She's the Southern Cross University Director of Strategic Projects and the founder of the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance based up there at SCU. We talk about early days of farming for her and her family, sort of background, how she got to be at age 21, the manager of their family property up there at Ebor. We talk about on-farm tourism, adoptive agriculture versus adaptive agriculture. She had her own experience with the bushfires of December that were rife um, in that part of the world. We talk about uh, grazing uh, ruminants and grass-fed beef and and we touch a little bit on, on human health and what she calls um, action research, which is fascinating, a very important component of this whole world of of um, regenerative farming and farming in, an, in a natural way. And we also talk about her definition of regenerative um, agriculture. We touch on a whole lot of different, really interesting things. I had a lot of fun with Lorraine. Always good value. Calls a spade a spade. And uh, I trust that you'll enjoy uh, Lorraine's spade calling uh, as much as I did at, in this uh, wonderful interview. Lorraine, um, thanks for joining us on our podcast, The Regenerative Journey. Um, Pleasure, Charlie. It's, I've been, we've been trying to tee this up for a little while now, haven't we? We have, we have. And, we were and at, I uh, noticed your gear's improving, mate. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, couldn't have been much worse than what I used to use. <laughs> Lorraine, um, why don't you tell us about where we are? This is Lorraine Gordon country up in at Ebor. It is. Um, and, and where we are, what we're doing here today. Yeah, so we're at the um, Wilmot uh, Field Day. So they're talking about really good grazing management practice and uh, everything that's going on here today is about regenerative practice in the grazing sector. And uh, congratulations to, um, to Wilmot for putting these sort of field days on because I think, if nothing else, farmers go away really starting to question how they farm mm. and why they do what they do. And it's a lot to take in in one day, but you know that's, that's how farmers learn, by talking to each other and hearing from other farmers what their experiences are. Have you got a sense of how many people hear from, um, uh, you know, maybe let's call them conventional farming backgrounds or, or you know, they're, they're, this is quite new to them. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to move that aside a little bit and show your face. There, there you go. Don't be shy. Jeez. Hide behind a mic. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I'm looking around the crowd here today. Obviously, rural Australia is a very small place um, when you get about like you and I mm. do. And I, I'm... Probably say we've got 50 50. Okay. You know, I think the great thing about these sort of days is that they do drag in some quite conventional farmers. Uh, in all honesty, I think a lot of the young ones really get it. And I think that's where our focus really needs to be. Um, it's sort of hard to lead, you can lead the, water, the horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think it's some people are open to try new things and, and to change the way they farm and others just take a bit longer to get there. Talking about um, drinking, we just had a little thunderstorm here uh, which made us all pack up our gear and come inside. Um, the season's, season's pretty good up here, Lorraine. Well, you've, you've, a bit of recovery has gone on. 
it's a very interesting thing that's going on in Ebor and traditionally people would say Ebor is drought proof. Mm. It's probably some of the best grazing country in Australia next to the Atherton Table. It's ah, up north. After Burua. After Burua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's really interesting what I've seen happen here in the last three or four years. And, you know, the rain, I guess, um, the rain has come later. You know, normally we used to, by the 1st of November, we would get big storms like we've seen this afternoon, every afternoon, downpours of rain. So three years ago, that sort of didn't come until December. Two years ago, it didn't come until January. And this year, you know, we're nearly into March. It was February before it came. So that's three months um, after what used to be a pretty reliable rainfall in a very reliable rainfall area such as Ebor. So, you know, it's not, it's not drought proof. And even Ebor itself is not, um, not removed from having far bad farming practices actually have repercussions in what is a very non-brittle area such as Ebor. I mean, we're basically, you know, next to rainforest here and Arctic beach mm -hmm. and it's incredible country. But that doesn't mean that if we don't practice grazing in a, in a regenerative manner that we can't stuff it up very quickly. It's not evident at the moment because, um, as I say and others say, you know, everyone looks at a good farm when it's rain and there's grass, but I guess to the trained eye you can sort of there are indicators, aren't there, that things um, you know, could be done differently. Certainly at Wilmot here they're doing a wonderful job of um, retaining ground cover. They had a bushfire through here yeah. um, I forgot, a number of three, three months ago now, I think it was. Mm. How did you – did you get cop that bushfire uh, We well? got smashed. We wow. absolutely got smashed by that fire. Actually, we were – I was caught in the middle of two fires that sort of decided they'd meet at our farm. Uh, so that got pretty interesting. We lost a lot of um, our boundary fences. We nearly lost um, Yarandu, our function centre. Uh, if it wasn't for RFS and National Parks um, bombing it with the, the choppers mm. uh, to save the, that sort of infrastructure. But we've probably got six to 12 months of cleaning up all the infrastructure around those buildings. Mm. Uh, so it was it was pretty nasty, and I've got to say, uh, I talked to some of my traditional landowners up here and, and Aboriginal folk, and none of us have ever seen rainforest burn like what we saw. Um, you know, th that's country that because of how wet and damp it normally is at this time of the year, just it's in, it used to be nearly impossible to burn. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly was a shock uh, to experience that, and I and I. Still wonder whether some areas will recover from what happened. It was a very hot fire. I want to get back to that um, because that's very topical. We're, we're, we're in the area that, as you said, you know, traditionally wasn't burnt. I know when Stuart took over the management of here, uh, at Wilmot, the previous manager said, we, you know, we don't get bushfires, we, you know, there's no, no plan. So I want to mm -hmm. pick that up later. But what I'm interested in is your regenerative journey. You know, you, you mm -hmm. are your... Um, you oh, actually, I won't spoil too much. Why don't you tell us the rain? Give us a okay. give us a bit of a map us, map it out a bit. Okay. Well, I guess I've been farming in Ebor for thirty four years, um, and I actually came from the city, so I came to run the family property at the age of twenty one. Mm. Um, I guess I was the only one left in the family with any any knowledge of the land, and that was minimal. In, in, in a lot of respect as well. I mean, I'd just gone to ag college. I'd always wanted to be a farmer, funnily enough, since I was 14, uh, the girl from the western suburbs of Sydney. But uh, and I went to ag college and um, I literally graduated from ag college and ended up coming straight up to Ebor to run this property, which in those days it didn't have any infrastructure, no improvements. In fact, it didn't even wasn't even fenced, so it was sort of the cattle we're running through fifty-five thousand hectares of national park and forestry, so it was a bit of a, a bit of a journey. Um, it was like just starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, in those days when I came up, you know, the obvious thing to do was to listen to your neighbours. What do they do? How do they farm up here? Because uh, at Ag College, I hadn't actually studied this area at all. I was into intensive irrigation and cropping and all sort all sorts of things other than uh, cattle grazing. So in that respect, you know, I sucked up all the knowledge I could from local farmers and, and the so-called experts and consultants and tried to keep up with the Joneses, you know, and it, there was so much work to do. To take a 100% native property, which was at the time 
you know, you're looking at nearly 6,000 acres of native pasture with very little fencing, had one paddock and no, in, no other infrastructure oh. except a couple of old cabins. And um, to sort of then think, oh, my God, I've got a clear country, I've got to improve it, I've got to get that, you know, triple super on, all of these things. It was just a nightmare because I had no cash. I had this property to run, but actually there was no funds. So, so just, on, can I say, yeah. just on that one, I mean, what got you here? Can I ask what was the, you know, from the city, um, you said you're sort of the only one of the family members with some farming sort of knowledge, your, your, yeah. your university. So what, what got you here to what sounds like a pretty dubious sort of a career path? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, I did lose a lot of family members in a space of a couple of years, um, all sorts of things heart attacks, car accidents, cancer, you name it, they all sort of started to bowl over. And it was sort of I was the last one standing, so to speak, um, that had any knowledge at all um, or any will to even want to go out to the back of nowhere, this, this gorgeous little place called Ebor, which had a population, probably still does, of about 80 people. And I think at that time that included dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but I just, you know, from the moment I hit here, I loved everything about it. I just... You know, I, I'd actually travelled out west. I'd been out in Canamble, Pilliga, Come By Chance and all those areas and every school holiday I ever had, um, I'd be gone out into country areas, um, including up here when I, was, when I was quite young. But, yeah, so it was an unfortunate, it was un, a series of unfortunate events that it, I ended up up here. And, uh, but I didn't. I never looked back because the challenges just kept coming, you know. And so I guess that's you talk about resilience. Well, you know, I'd sort of in those days had had it all. I was 21 years old, and I'm trying to tell, you know, older men who they were in their 60s, a lot of them that worked on that property, you know, that I had to. I was in charge now, not them. And uh, that wasn't easy either. <laughs> and a, you know, a woman like that, it's hard enough for a young buck to come home or come back to a property. Yeah. But to, yeah, that would that would have been tough too. Yeah, it was that was, it was interesting. Mm. It was interesting. And you learn a lot about people. Knowing you, Lorraine, I'm sure you just got on and did it. Well, it was either that or it was gone. So mm. I only had, there was a caveat on this property, which made it quite interesting, that I was did be given a couple of years to turn it around before anybody could sell it or do anything. Did you know that at the time? Uh, I did find that out about yeah. halfway through. Yeah. And um, so there was, you know, there was a fairly good uh, carrot at the end to make sure that this thing worked, this, this idea of me being there to run it. But anyway, the journey sort of did continue. And one thing, I, I did get into tourism on the place pretty early on because I, know, I knew that I needed, needed another enterprise um, so we could be profitable. And trout fishing was a big thing up here. So I could see these fly fishermen coming, staying in our cabins, old family friends from the city. And I thought, God, there must be a way to make money out of this. I've got a national park on my doorstep and I've got all these people wanting to come and fish for trout. So I quickly cottoned onto those industries. Mm -hmm. And so I've had that sort of joint career, I guess, in tourism and agriculture. And uh, I think that gave me a little bit of an edge in some ways because I could look at look at the whole industry, the beef industry, and question why do we do things this way? You know, why are we such price takers? Why don't we just do what, constantly do what everybody else tells us to do? Because in the tourism industry, you set your product, you set your price, you deliver a standard that's your standard and you get, you get reimbursed for that quality service and product that you supply. To the so, consumer. So that was a bit of a, a point of difference for you and a, and a real benefit having not had the farming paradigms? And Yeah, I came from a different paradigm in that context and I thought, well, why don't we do this for beef? And so it's about 28, I think it's 28, 29, it could even be 30 years ago now that Ebor Beef was born out of that concept. I when thought, you must have been only 10 then, Lorraine. I'm only 10. I'm sure <laughs> I'm not much older, Charlie, than 10. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I thought... You know, we are stronger working together. Mm. We're all trying to market our stock. But imagine if 100 cattle farmers from the area actually pulled the resor their resources together, employed a coordinator to market their cattle. Then we'd have a voice because we'd have a lot of product. Quality grass-fed beef coming off inc an incredible area, um, clean farms 
And I thought, wow, that's a product. So the concept of eball beef was born, and it's still going today. Similar was numbers. Was doing that? Was it? Was it a new? Was it a? No, they weren't uh, at the time. Anyway, um, no. And so it was myself and a couple of others, including Wayne Upton, who was the beefo at the time. Wayne was a um, he was a lecturer of mine. That's him. He's, he's still <laughs> he's still about and a really? great bloke. And Good yeah, time. so we got our heads together on that one, and and uh, off it went from there. And uh, it's been it is a marketing group. They dabbled into. Uh, actually you know investing along the supply chain and having a branded product and that's that's a difficult road in the beef industry because you've got a lot of waste and you've got to be able to sell the whole beast um so it's not all not every cut is a premium cut so uh you know for various reasons um they got out of that space but uh, still going today is a very strong marketing group and i think that sort of brings in where i've ended up today you know the whole power of collaborating with others and working together and whether that be something like a cooperative structure or just a, a loose collaboration or some other form, you know, farmers are always going to be stronger when they pool resources and work together um, with each other. Uh, that, that's when really, you know, magic things can happen from there. Well, they say, um, you know, you want to go, you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's it. That's it. Um, so Ebor Beef, when did you, when did you sort of start? Um, I mean, the word regenerative agriculture is a reasonably new one. When did you uh, start thinking about um, that type of farming or variations of that? Well, I did. Uh, I think I must have been one of the first students ever to um, do RCS with Terry McCosca and really? crew. Where, and where was that? That was, I think I did that up in Toowoomba, yeah. actually, um, when I went to his first school, when I went to that school. That was a real turning point. So um, a real paradigm shift. I thought, oh, my God, I only need a wheelbarrow. I don't need to have to, you know, I mean, it was pretty extreme stuff back mm -hmm. then. But it was still what we all needed. We needed a jolt to the system. And, you know, RCS and Terry McCosker's done more for, you know, grazing and farming in this country than anyone else I know, really. And I and I think a lot of people would agree with that. And uh, so I did I did his school back in the day twenty odd years ago, and since then I think I've done it four times because I've put children through it and staff through it, and and each time I come away with just another little thought bubble on what if you know. So it's you never stop learning, which is I think what's held me in this agricultural space so solidly for so long. Because I like a challenge and I like to continually learn. And the difference between agriculture and the tourism sector is I think you can, the lessons run out pretty quickly in tourism. They're pretty well, if you do this and you put this with that, you'll get that result. It doesn't work that way when you're talking ecology and agriculture, you know, because you'll get a different result every time. So that's the key is to be able to read a landscape and actually read what's going on. Um, with your soils, with your plants, with your, the animals, with everything. You've got to be able to have that, um, I guess, very open mind to question everything you're seeing. And uh, that's what keeps me here. That's a great point um, about the, uh, the comparing tourism and agriculture. I've never I've thought of that way. I guess the, you know, what, what we say is, um, you know, my sense of regenerative agriculture is it's a very non-prescriptive type of farming, you know, because the alternative of what I used to do and I mm. used to do when you got back to Ebor originally was a very prescriptive, you know, talk to the agronomist, what do I spray, what do I put down, yeah. what are my inputs, what's my outputs. It, it's, it doesn't allow for the flexibility of, 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 um, of making a lot of your own decisions essentially and actually being responsible for those decisions. Um, so, and then that leads to sort of, you know, the, the adoption versus adaption mm. of... Um, mm. of, of practices. What, what practices did you uh, adapt? Well, certainly the time control grazing. Mm. So then that has made a massive difference on our farm. You know, I think back then we would have been carrying a few hundred head and now, you know, we're a thousand head of steers, you know, aiming for the MSA grass fed market. So, and that's not put it from putting on masses of superphosphate and artificial fertilisers. Yes, I do correct um, the mineral deficiencies in the soil based on soil tests. Uh, so, you know, there are 
there are inputs as needed. Um, but yes, it's been a slow but evolving journey. And, you know, I always say when I talk about regenerative ag, you know, you don't need to go into complete detox here. You don't have to adopt 10 tools at once. And, and when I explain to other farmers some of the tools we use in regenerative ag, a lot of them say, wow, I'm already doing two or three of those things. And then that's the light bulb moment. And I say, you know what, you're already on the journey. You're already on that journey to farming more sustainably and repairing any damage that's been previously done. And just take it gently because, you know, nobody likes to go into a complete detox and think, particularly in farming, you know, that's a good way to go broke. So it's, it's just a gentle, gentle. And I guess the other thing that, you know, so often we hear, um, and, you, and you do hear it in organics, you know, it's a very prescriptive model. You tick that box, you get your organic certification. Well, in regenerative ag, it's not like that because it's a whole way of thinking. It's holistic thinking and it's questioning and it's a different journey for everybody that takes it. And uh, so it's not a prescriptive type journey to take. It's just different tools for different circumstances, always keeping in mind that everything comes from the soil. And as we've heard today, you know, you look after your pastures, they'll look after the soil, and it'll all look after the animals. So uh, it's just a different, it's a different way of thinking. Uh, and, you know, the whole regenerative practice, uh, it's going to take over the world. It's not all about agriculture, but of course it starts with agriculture. Most things do. But we'll see regenerative practice in our urban design, uh, in our health systems, in everything, because it's all connected. Lorraine, um, your regenerative journey doesn't just consist of farming and tourism. What else? I know what else you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what, else what I'm doing do. now, or what I'm doing. Like, oh, I don't know. Like you oh, know, the, geez, maybe, maybe even the stuff you were doing to get to where you are now that was off farm. You know, you're, yeah. you you've been the recipient of a number of awards, um, business awards, and and entrepreneurial type awards. You know, how did you get to that point? Oh, that's not thunder. That's Charlie's bag falling off the seat. Oh, was it? Oof. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's interesting. I. Um, like I said, I do like challenges. I've been everything from a commercial banker. Um, I've, I've was CEO of Regional Development Australia for the Mid North Coast. So I'm very much into industry, um, communities, I said social empowerment, all sorts of different areas. Uh, my passion has always been agriculture, and I've never left it. But I've gone off and done a lot of other things which I think gives me a different set of eyes when I look at challenges because I think often uh, challenges are solved by looking at how they solved it in a completely different sector or a completely different industry. And I would often use those skills, the skills I've learned in banking or the skills I've learned in uh, regional development. Um, you know, I'm an ecological economist is what I would refer myself as. That sounds you know. cool. It is cool. Mm. It is cool because mm. what that's about is putting a value on the environment. Um, and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing to be able to do and it's not easy. So I, I think all of these different career paths that I've played with and uh, thoroughly enjoyed, you know, each one I thought, God, it doesn't, this is fascinating stuff. It doesn't get better than this. And then I landed at Southern Cross University um, running the, the Farming Together program. Which tell, was all tell, us about, about, tell us about that. Yeah, well, you know, that was, that was a, a brave initiative, you know, impossible timeframes, um, not enough money to achieve what it needed to achieve, and yet we managed to, um, you know, bring over 28,000 farmers, fishers and foresters on a, on a journey of collaboration on how to work together along their supply chains um, to in, improve not only the decision-making but giving them some power back at the farm gate. So improve their bottom line, but looking at every project that the university backed had to tick that box of being good for the environment, socially acceptable and good for communities, and, in, and it also had to deliver um, profits back into farmers, fishers and foresters' pockets. And that's your triple bottom line approach. Uh, so that was an amazing program, um, federally funded, 
and the university along, you know, with a, with a great team we had in place, uh, ended up supporting farmer groups all over Australia. So we covered literally every region and every industry, um, uh, primary industry in the country with that program. And from Farming Together um, was born the Regenerative Ag Alliance. Tell us about that. <laughs> Is that a world it's first? Exciting. Do you think? I know it's been oh, you've, yeah. you've, it's a couple of world firsts in the last couple of years. Tell us about that. Well, nobody owns the term regenerative or regenerate or regen. That's, it's not something you can own. And the whole concept of ownership is, you know, that's, it's just not real. It's like nobody ever really owned the term sustainable. And uh, sustainable, if you looked up the meaning of sustainable, uh, there was probably a hundred different definitions for what, what is sustainable. And that'll be the case for regenerative. Mm. But I just felt that after all the experience with farming together, and interestingly enough, when the Regenerative Ag Alliance was born, uh, it was born out of um, a conversation walking around the back blocks of the western suburbs of Sydney. And I thought, what's next? You know, we've got this great program, we've done amazing things, we're probably in for a change of government, so they'll probably want a change of change name. Change something, of course. Change you know, let's form. be honest. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, this is the sustainability ship has sailed. What young people want to sustain status quo? Mm. How boring is that? Mm. We don't want to just sustain. We want to improve. We want to repair. We want it to be better. And so it was just the obvious thing was to let's regenerate. Let's, let's turn whatever we've, you know, ignorantly done wrong in the past, let's now really focus on making it better for future generations so that my kids can still enjoy farming and their kids can still be there as well. And society can eat healthy, nutritious food um, because if we don't, I think we're in a, in a very fast, slippery slope to the bottom. So what does the alliance look like, Lorraine? What, how is it operating? It's, um, what's, its, what's its charter? Okay, so so the alliance. Uh, what does it look like? It it actually includes all the leading practitioners um, in the country, and it's it's growing because there's 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 more and more of them coming out, which is fantastic. So the leading farming practitioners, those that have done it, not just that just those that talk about it, but those that actually have experienced it, have been on the journey, have originally done it. In, in done it wrong and admitted they've made mistakes and learnt from those mistakes and, and really been their own researchers. Um, you know, that's really a form of action research at its best. So the leading uh, practitioners in the country are involved with the Alliance, the leading researchers, leading academics and teachers. And we all come together um, and basically try and address some of the really complex issues that we're facing. None of us think we have all the answers, but together we sure give it a shake. So uh, that's what it's about. We come together and we talk um, about those challenges and how we might be able to advise our decision makers, for example, on how to do things in, more, in a more proactive manner. So what we've seen uh, in this country is a lot of reactive policies. Um, and unfortunately, that's the nature of politics. And uh, I don't think that's doing Australia any favours right now. And I'm not pointing the finger at any particular party. I think it's perhaps a problem with the system. So we've seen reactive policies um, that really haven't served us that well. In fact, it's in some respects, it's propped up bad farming practice. It's Band-Aid stuff. You know, there's no point, you know, really giving money... Pe uh, money to farmers to build a hay shed if they've got no hay to put in the shed, so to speak. Mm. <laughs> um, and I don't, you know, there's, there's farming communities that need a lot of help at the moment and I, I don't want to take away from that. But it's good policy to actually be proactive in encouraging good practice. That will, that will actually help us survive into the future. So that's one thing the Alliance does. It uh, certainly brings a lot of voices, respected voices, together to try and shape the future of decision-making in the country. 
The other thing we're very focused on being located in a university um, and in a university that's prepared to be brave and at the cutting edge of what's going on on the planet uh, is that we're very focused on education because the agricultural educa education systems in this country really haven't changed track in the last 50 years. Um, and I'm not pointing the finger at any particular universities. It's just time to shake things up and really question the way we teach, what we teach, and, uh, and how we go about it. So um, thanks to Southern Cross being quite open-minded and, like I said, brave to go down that path, uh, we do have the first Bachelor of Science in Regenerative Agriculture in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, from there now we're focusing on post-grad qualifications and um, even diplomas to get, you know, to help some of these ag colleges that unfortunately all over the country were closed down years ago. And uh, that's probably the biggest mistake we ever made because now who's going to farm? And um, Lorraine, you've got uh, 80, <coughs> 80, 80 sign-ups already, um, I believe, and it's kicking off, you know, next month. Well, what we it's have... a pretty positive start. Well, it's actually more than that, Charlie, because what we have is we've got... Oh. Sorry, Ooh, just, for, just for the listeners and the, wa the watchers... We've been, we we had to move inside uh, half an hour ago before we started because of the rain and then the thunder. So you are you are in the thick of it here. It hasn't rained for ten or fifteen minutes now. That's what it is. That's not sound effects. That's the sound, folks. Evil. That's the sound. <laughs> it's of real. What? It's, it's real. real. That's real. Real. Real good stuff. I can't remember what the question was now. Um, we were talking about the the uh, the um the the degree mm -hmm. um and eighty sign ups. You oh were, yeah, yeah. So what we actually have is we've had one hundred and eighty sign ups into Get the Bachelor of, of Science, and they're yeah. still trying to pick their subjects. So eighty uh, of those have actually actually chosen their regen subjects, and we're working our way through the rest to actually choose the subjects that they want to study. So. And I must say, it hasn't hit UAC yet, so it hasn't hit the school system, and nor did it make the course offerings mm -hmm. in time. So this has got to be probably the fastest degree known to man to ever get established <laughs> at well, a we university. We were talking about, about it in April or May last year. Yeah, it, it got up within six months. She was up and running, and I think that's just because you know the need was so great, mm -hmm. the, the the sense of urgency um, in the farming communities. It was just overwhelming and there was no time to waste. And uh, so really it's almost like, I don't know, how would you put it? It's like flying a 747 while you're still building the engine at times. Um, <laughs> but that's what's great about it because it can, uh, you know, it brings in all of the, that expertise from those practising practitioners on their farms, mm. listening to real farmers doing incredible stuff and seeing the evidence. So students can see the evidence for themselves. So there'll be field trips and case studies. Yeah, and residential schools cool. on different properties and farms um, with those leading practitioners, you know, with the Charlie Masseys, with the Terry McCoskers, um, you know, all of the, with yourself, you know. Um, and, yes, we'll be going to Burrawa. <laughs> yeah, well, and David, Braidwood. David Marsh is down. You're gonna, we will go and see, see the Malay dudes and yeah. all of those guys. You know, they're all they all play a really important part in the story. But what's vitally important because we are a university is that it is all underpinned um, by good science, and uh, in, in some cases, you know, it, it, it's an emerging science. It's an emerging area of research. Uh, the research will will be trying to catch up. And uh, research doesn't happen quickly, but it, you know this has to have um, really good, solid, uh, peer-reviewed um, work behind it um, by leading leading academics as well. So the discussions are rich, and uh, it, and I think that's the sweet spot. You know, you bring bring practice together um, with researchers and teachers, and you've got something special. And the good news is there's no agenda either. You know, there's, there's in terms of, you know, we understand the benefits. We're understanding them more and more. We heard a lot of amazing stuff from Christine Jones today about, you know, soil. And, you know, there's, there's the, a lot of people would say that some universities uh, study and research is sort of um, at, for the benefit of, of particular industry, you know. So my, my the good news is that, that um, I feel that, that, that this, this course is it's a, uh, 
it's a it'll, you know it's a transparent um, industry. It's a span, mm-hmm. you know with, with transparent research that is really looking for the best practice in this new or should not say new agriculture because it's actually old agriculture, isn't it? But it's a a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. Lorraine, I want to go back to the bushfires, um, devastating across the eastern seaboard and Western Australia as well and South Australia. There was a lot of fires everywhere. It was it was quite widespread. Mm. Um, you were at the coalface, so to speak. Um, what what do you think we as a nation learnt from 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 the fire? Did did we learn anything? You know, urban and and farming. You know, the the people uh, who who suffered. Um, and if they did, what they, what do you think they learned? And what we should what maybe should we have learned? I think it was a massive electric shock. Actually, mm. I think it. Uh, geez. How do you say this? But in, in some respects, it, it almost takes a catastrophe like that to wake decision makers up. I'm not sure if they're 100% awake just yet, but, you know, it's uh, not wanting to be a pessimist because I'm not. I'm an absolute optimist. But um, I don't think we're out of, we're out of this yet. Um, you know, we've, we've copped it all, haven't we? We've had, you know, these extended dry periods when we're expecting that it, that's not a dry time for us. We've had, so we've had drought. We've had horrendously hot fires that just couldn't even be controlled. Um, and now floods, you know, we've got the heavy rainfall and I'm just waiting on the locust plague and we're just about at the last chapter of the Bible, really. So <laughs> The pestilence is the, on its way. Yeah, there is a chapter <laughs> that talks about this stuff. <laughs> However... You know, what that does is, it's ca- what this is, is chaos theory unfolding. And out of chaos comes um, emerging systems and change. And there's, you know, there's a lot of science behind this stuff. And ecology leads the way when it comes to understanding, you know, the emerging theories that came out, you know, that come from chaos theory. Mm. And uh, so good will come out of this. Totally. It will just be a really rocky journey um, to get there, but I think we'll get there. And I've got a lot of faith in uh, future generations and in, even in the young people that I work with now because they get it. And uh, like I said, they're not happy with sustaining what they've been handed. They want us to fix it, and I think we have a role to get it right for them, uh, and and not not fight it. Just go with it, um, take that step, one step at a time. But in my case, please step quite fast because otherwise we will run out of time. Um, and yeah, we do. We need to wake up to the big electric shock that we've just had, and uh, react to that in a way that is uh, going to protect the future. I think it's presented a massive opportunity. You know, the, the, the it to, has. To, you know, the, 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 I guess my thinking has been I, I, there's an opportunity for this not to happen again in 15 or 20 years' time. You know, uh, I don't know, I don't have the answers or the methods, but I just think there's, you know, that's, that, that could be a motivating factor that, you know, we can, I think we can avoid this in, in many ways from happening again because we certainly don't want it. If we learn by it. If we, that's exactly it, yeah. If we learn by it. Yep, yep. Uh, because, you know, there's no point having short memories. You know, we we can't keep making the same mistakes. You know, that's that's not going to serve us well. So, and I guess, you know, you talk about what the, the charter is of the Regen Ag Alliance. Well, you know, I've talked about being able to influence those policy decisions um, and being able to offer... Um, new educational products that actually meet the needs of future farmers. and uh, But the, the third very important aspect to all of this is the ongoing research that has to happen. And um, again, what we've done at Southern Cross is we've, you know, the challenges that farmers face um, have come to us and, and farmers have asked us to help them to solve these challenges. So it, it's very grassroots driven um, research that we're now undertaking. We're trying to, you know, help them to solve some of these really complex issues we're facing. And by putting, you know, our top level researchers and our students together with with practitioners and farmers, it it takes all of that to solve these issues. Um, And the constant uh, research that has to go on in all of these spaces to to get us there uh, 
is another focus area for the Alliance. Lorraine, um, just switching to the world, um, what do you think, what role do you think Australia might be playing or could play um, yeah, on the world stage? Is it, has it a role to play? Is it doing it? Is it, is it sort of, what, and what, what do you think the, the, the sense of um, other countries is of what we're doing here? Oh, boy, I think we're an amazing case study for the world. I mean, let's face it, in a couple of hundred years, we've nearly stuffed our whole country. So that's interesting. <laughs> so they're all watching. All eyes are on us now. So here we are. <laughs> White civilization has come in, and in 200 years, you know, we haven't really... We haven't uh, done our country many favours. But it's, it hasn't been on purpose. You know, we, we, we came here, we bought in European farming systems... Our soils are the oldest soils in the world. You know, we don't and shouldn't farm the way Europe farms because we need to farm the Australian way. We needed to listen to Indigenous elders while the knowledge was still there and we, we didn't. So we've made some massive mistakes. Let's make no bones about that. So the world is watching us. Mm. The world knows Australia. I mean, the world watched Australia burn. I mean, it was on every news in every country of the world... And no wonder it affected our tourism sector because literally the world thought the whole country was, was on fire. fire. Yeah. And, you know, there was times uh, for me when I'm on the, the north coast and in the northern table is that I felt the whole world was, you know, the whole country was on fire as well. And so they're now watching, well, what, what's, what is Australia going to do? You know, are they going to start to get serious about, for instance, reducing our greenhouse emissions, meeting our Paris agreements? So... We don't want to look like fools, but we possibly could if we don't get serious about some of the actions we need to take. And so it's we're already on the world stage of having a whole heap of issues to deal with. What's important now is how we deal with those issues and how serious we get about making sure we become leaders in the space, not idiots. So how, how what do you what would if you were um, Lorraine Gordon? You've just been anointed the the you're, you're now the prime minister. Um, heaven, I know. Heaven forbid. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. I just felt I'd that wasn't the, thunder I'd that you go, just heard. That's you, like you, about a hundred Australians <laughs> that know me really well. That just a shiver went up the back of their spine. <laughs> Come on, you didn't invite me to lunch in the in the big house. Um, <laughs> So, what would you do? What, 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 what would, what would be the first? What would you do in the first, first hundred days? Listen to the scientists. Mm. That would be the first thing. I think uh, I'd, I'd bring the many perspectives in the those the proven ones. You know, the ones that have actually know what they're talking about. Um, the science deniers. You know, I just. Uh, I find them completely bemusing at times, you know. Science has been telling us this for a long time, what was going to happen and where we were heading. So it's only a fool that doesn't at least, you know, open their mind to listen to this stuff and uh, and those that know what they're talking about. So, yeah, it's really important, I think, um, particularly for politicians, that they actually get the right advice. You know, the, the, the thing I do notice is that a lot of the so-called uh, advisors, you know, straight out of university wanting to have a political career is not really a good recipe for solving complex issues. So it's really important to get good advice. Um, I mean, any good business person would surround themselves with their knowledge gaps, you know, people that can actually help them on that journey um, to have a successful business. Surround well, yourself with people smarter than you. Absolutely. If yeah. you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Look out, yeah. And if you're employing people that aren't smarter than yourself, you're mm. pretty stupid. <laughs> so, you know, like I look at, you know, I've got a fantastic team at Southern Cross Uni. I've got a fantastic team in my own company. They've been with me for a long time. And um, I turn to them for advice because you can't know all things. Nobody can know all no. things. So uh, that's the first, you know, you talk about, how would you run a country? Well, you need to surround yourself with smart people that know what they're talking about. That's a really good start. Um, and you need to look long-term. It's about long-term vision. It's not about getting elected in the next three years. It's about what's best in the long-term for communities, um, 
and for the environment and for the country. So uh, we don't tend to... We have that very short-term um, focus on everything and that, that's killing us. You, know, you can't achieve anything in, in, in a, in a three-year turnaround because we spend one year in election mode. Mm. So you've only got then two years, you've got six months to sort out. So you actually only got a year and a half to actually do anything. Do anything, yeah. So it's... Um, yeah, I mean, the system's broken, let's face it. <laughs> and do you think, um, Lorraine, uh, that w- what's, where's, how, how can people be the most effective to contribute to, um, I, I'm sort of generalising, calling it a regenerative agriculture movement. I mean, it includes, you know, um, uh, reducing carbon levels. It includes human health. There's so many different things. I mean, what can what can people do? Because, of, you know, some, a lot of people... Um, uh, you know, say we need to change legislation first, um, and then things will take. You know, things will happen. Um, other people say, "Well, no, you've actually just got to go out and do it." And other people say, "Well, no, you've got to do the research." So, is there a sort of a particular, you know, effective way that you know, whether we're talking about urban people or mm. we're talking about farmers? Yeah, sure. Well, I don't think government will lead the way in this. So I think that's not going to happen. I think the consumer is king. Consu- I mean, I come there from you tourism. Go. There you consumer go. There you is go. king. Eaters, you're the king. So when the consumer starts to be really informed and aware of how food is produced. Um, and I'm not – you've got to be very careful that, um, you know, they, they don't come from a position of ignorance either, you know, because, for instance, hooved animals have a huge role to play. Grass-fed hooved animals have a huge role to play in in sequestering carbon and reducing greenhouse emissions and uh, bringing these temperatures down. Um, you know, they're magic what they can do um, if the grazing systems are done right so that we're regenerating pastures and increasing photosynthesis and encouraging that root growth and that the, the microbes in the soil to do their magic. And so without those hooved animals in a grazing environment, it's pretty bloody hard to do without, you know, those good grazing systems. And I'm not talking about set stocking here and I'm... And I don't want to sort of get into a debate about intensive um, uh, animal farming uh, as against free range. and uh, But, you know, there are differences. So as a consumer, don't sit there and say, well, you know, I'll become a, a vegan or a vegetarian because livestock production is bad. That's coming from a point of ignorance because not all livestock production is bad. Um, so learn about the different ways your food is produced because the omega-3s, the levels of omega-3s in grass-fed beef are equivalent to that of fish and the consumer doesn't know that. Uh, So, you know, you've got this massive, um, you know, the nutritional value, for instance, of grass-fed beef is extremely high, Um, but that message doesn't get through. And the co-benefit of that hoofed, animal with pastures and regenerative practice is uh is is something that consumers don't understand either and so that's sad so we've got a whole education process to go through here um and yeah be careful of stuff that you read or that you watch on the tv or that you hear you know is it is it actually good academic literature or is it, is it just someone's opinion that's doing a blog um, that actually has no science behind it whatsoever. So, you know, when we hear figures, for instance, and it's a bit of a – becomes a sore spot with me, but I, I hear these figures banded around about, you know, the emissions that agriculture causes. Well, can I just say that, you know, at the farm gate, it's actually only 10 to 12%. But you hear stuff out there all the way up to, you know, 27%, 40 you see, you see this stuff and you go, well, where's the science behind that? And, and where did you get these percentages from? Because it's actually, you know, there's no truth in this stuff. It's just somehow this percentage has been plucked out of thin air and there is no science behind that. So at the farm gate, um, you know, the emissions uh, are really at that 12% level and that's based on science. And in the livestock industry, we can actually reduce those methane levels through our practices. So good grazing practice, mixed species, great new um, science in inventions such as our red seaweed products and stuff like that that's coming along hard and fast, 
can reduce that down to nothing. So I guess the consumer needs to get informed using quality science as the backdrop to do that. Just on the seaweed, I was talking to a fellow last night. Um, I did, at, at university, I did a, uh, a thesis on the use of seaweed extracts and growing tomatoes. <laughs> Fascinating stuff, Lorraine. Um, oh. But funnily enough, the seaweed stuff keeps on coming back to me you know, over all these years. And I was chatting with a guy last night, and he is has a business. I'm not sure if I can name the business yet, um, but he's um, working on a specific species of seaweed. The tests have been doing uh, are showing that there's a, um, I hope I get this right, there's a 20% um, uh, improvement in, in feed conversion, essentially. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's all, so there's a productivity gain and there's also a, um, because of the uh, a natural um, process that takes place in the, in the gut when the, when the seaweed's eaten, just 30 grams a day, mm-hmm. um, reduces methane significantly. It's 90%, Charlie. Is that 90%? And, it's an, and it's an enzyme. It's just an enzyme. It's the, not the, the whole. It's present in. It's getting the, that enzyme out of the seaweed, the seaweed. Is, the, is the tricky bit. But look, you know, we've got great scientists working on this right now. Mm. They're nearly there. At, at, at SE, um, at SCU, Cross. yeah, a Marine Science Centre, uh, uh, um, active in the space. Syro's ap- active in the Syro, space. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're all we all talk. We're all working together. That problem will be solved. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. I guess that's the thing. You know, the debate is interesting, but just be careful where you're getting your knowledge sources or who your knowledge source is, I guess. And also, um, as farmers, we get a lot of our knowledge and our experience from experience, don't we? Like we have to, we, we, we sort of, you know, it's only a mistake if you do it twice. You're going to make a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, mistakes. What um, any... Did you have, have you made mistakes? Oh, I've not made mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking, I'm not, what level do you want to talk at? <laughs> I'm um, not talking about in the kitchen when you burnt the, oh, no, the souffle no, no. or something. That's I'm just talking. a laugh. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I, I see farmers, we are the ultimate in action research, aren't we? Action research. That's I like what that. I call I just call research all these stuff ups and mistakes. You know, that's just action research at play, really, isn't it? It's like, cool. well, hell, that didn't work. I'll go this way, I'll try this one. And it's, it is, and that's that's what it's all about. Um, I guess that the only difference is farmers don't, you know, write an academic paper every time they learn something. They pass the knowledge on to each other. And that's an, that's important too. Uh, but I think now we're, we're in a period of incredible reflection and, um, you know, action research is taking place very fast. And... Uh, so I guess my role is to ensure that quality research backs up um, where it's all heading, that we deliver um, state-of-the-art educational products and meet the needs of our future students and equip them to be able to solve these complex problems themselves. Teach them to think. Remember the days when education was actually helping you to think for yourself, mm-hmm. not just gobble up textbooks of information and spit it out at the other end and pass exams, but actually really navel gaze and think about what the hell's going on here. Well, it gets back to that uh, non-prescriptive sort of uh, mentality, isn't yeah. it? You know, you've got to yeah. you know, have the, the, the successes, the failures, the, the try this and don't do that. That's right. And the fact is we don't have all the answers. Mm. I'm not sure we ever will. I mean, that'd be that's a crazy thought. Um, but it's a hell of a fun journey finding out, you know, how we can do things better. So it's it's a continuous learning um, spiral. And just because, you know, just because the science hasn't isn't always there, doesn't mean we shouldn't research and find out what's going on. You know, that's that's how we ended mm. up moving from candles to light bulbs and. From um, the horse and cart to the automobile, to the I motor guess, car. isn't it? Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. If just because we don't have the science beh- behind something doesn't mean we shouldn't go and research and try find and, out what's find going out. on. Yeah. Talking about research, the guys who are Maya grazing um, here and and uh, and Wilmot certainly, um, I guess you'd call a, um, uh, a demonstration of the use of the Maya grazing program, which is essentially a program which helps graziers monitor their well, help them with the feed budging, monitor mm. their grazing um, use and grazing planning, which is a fantastic tool. Um, mm. Great use of technology that I think is, um, yeah, a really useful 
um, mm. use of technology. So the guys here today, Will Mott, have done a, an amazing job of demonstrating that and putting together, as you just mentioned, Lorraine, you know, people who are um, very smart. Is that Lorraine? Yes, Lorraine. too. Um, they're very smart. They've got so much wisdom and, and information to impart, and we've had a, um, a wonderful day. Lorraine, before we go, as the rain falls down, I've got to ask you um, always conjecture about the definition of regenerative agriculture. Yeah, well... Is there such a thing? No, I don't believe there is. I think it means different things to different people. There's lots of great definitions, mm. and some will resonate more with, with some than others. Um, I always say it's leaving the landscape and your environment in a better state than you found it. That's, that's what fits with me. Um, but, you know, there's, there's lots of definitions. And I, I really think it depends on where somebody is at the time on, on how they want to describe what Regen Ag is really about to them. Where they are on their journey. On their journey, yeah. Well, Lorraine, you've left me in a better state than when you found me. Oh, so please, 53 Charlie. minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking for 53 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm really interested and I'm very keen to, to follow and be involved in the, the, um, the regenerative ag, uh, agriculture um, uh, course and the, you know, mm. the, at uh, Southern Cross University. So many wonderful things happening, so many good people involved. Um, and thank you for your time. And Pleasure, Charlie. Thank you. Really thank, thank, the, thank whoever we need to, the big guy for the... The rain that's falling again. And there's nothing like being in a field day, is there? Like I just, Such I had about day. 500 emails I hadn't got to by last night and I just thought, damn it, I just need to go and be with farmers, mm. kicking the dirt, just, you know, sharing knowledge and finding where out where everyone's at. And I, I think, you know, that's what probably both of us, you know, we get a lot of, a lot of joy out of that. So much joy. Um, and thank you for the joy you've given us and our listeners today. Lorraine, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, what a wonderful interview there with Lorraine. Um, always been an inspiration to me, just her can-do attitude and always good fun chatting with Lorraine. Our next episode is with uh, one of my favourites, David Marsh. He is a, um, a Burrawa farmer, um, only 15 minutes from, from Hannah Minow here at Burrawa. And uh, has been a mentor of mine for some years now. Always looked up to David. Uh, even when he was, we were both sort of conventionally farming, he always did a pretty good job, um, I thought. So um, he's certainly been one of my, um, I guess one of my inspirations, I have to say. So we, we spoke very candidly about his history, how he got to be where he is now in terms of his regenerative farming approach, his holistic um, farm management. And uh, in Allendale, where we uh, did the interview, was where I started, um, I guess, a lot of my interviews on YouTube, just chatting with David in the paddock about dung beetles, cattle, weather, rain, grass. Um, now, don't forget to subscribe, uh, share, comment, uh, rate, and do all those wonderful things. Uh, the more people we get listening to this podcast, the more we will get the message out there. And uh, I think that is a pretty important and compelling thing for us all to do. Um, and also a big shout out to Landcare Australia for their support in helping put together this, uh, this podcast, this first series of The Regenerative Journey. Catch up with you all next week. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. And as the recipient of the Bob Hawke Landcare Award, Charlie would like to thank Landcare Australia for their support in the creation of this first series of The Regenerative Journey.